Woohoo! It's the latest issue of Schmazmo. Let's take the personality quiz, shall we? Question one. Your jerk boss ruins your weekend by making you work on Saturday on a project you find demeaning. Do you A. Swallow your pride and comply to keep your job? Or B. Tell your boss to shove it and storm out shouting a crude reference to your and or your boss's genitalia? I think that one's obvious. Question two. The ex-lover for whom you still have feelings announces their wedding date. Do you A. Accept your ex's decision and wish them well? Or B. Show up to the wedding drunk and uninvited to proclaim your love in front of all their family and friends. Boy, I've been there, man. Question three. You witness a bag full of $100 bills fall off a truck. Do you A. Deliver the bag to the proper authorities? Or B. Buy a Ferrari? Man, I'm acing this thing. Question number four. A mysterious stranger has witnessed all your poor decisions and is threatening you with blackmail. Do you A. Repent your mistakes and hope life will return to normal? Or B. Murder the blackmailer and dump the body in a swamp? Okay, tally up your responses. If you answered mostly A's, congratulations, you are a normal, socially functional individual. Mostly B's, you are some sort of psychopath, stay away from me. But let's do this again and say that your choices will have no negative consequences. No matter what you do, there's no chance of punishment or embarrassment. Then I bet some of your answers would change then, wouldn't they? Well, these questions are exaggerated versions of decisions we make every day, what Sigmund Freud might call the battle between the id and the superego. On one side, we have the socially responsible path, the one where we follow the rules, do what others expect of us, and make the most prudent decision. On the other side, we have the pursuit of pure selfish desire, to do whatever is most emotionally satisfying at the moment. Now, because most of us aren't psychopaths, we choose the first path but we fantasize about the second. Hollywood movies, of course, are fantasy machines. Their entire appeal comes from catering to all our various fantasies. And according to genre theorist Rick Altman, there's a structure to all this. A structure that gives us pleasure because it lets us be naughty. In Altman's book, Film Slash Genre, by the way, back in the 70s and 80s, it was considered cool for theorists to name their stuff with just a bunch of terms with slashes or commas in between, like cinema slash ideology slash criticism, or ideology comma genre comma auteur, or most creatively, film slash cinema slash movie. I guess there was no time for words like the or and. Um, anywho, in film slash genre, Rick Altman proposes what he calls the generic crossroads. Now, generic here doesn't mean those store brand Fruit Loops your mom likes to buy. Already stale. Generic here refers to movie genres, because Rick Altman believed this to be a core property of Hollywood genre movies, but it really could apply to any commercial narrative film. The gist of Altman's theory is that every genre movie places its main character on a path where they encounter a series of crossroads. That is a choice between two options. On one side, we have the safe, modest, prudent path that obeys social rules, norms, and expectations. On the other side, we have a deviant path that violates these rules, norms, and expectations. One side promises safety and security. The other side risk and danger, fun, and excitement. And at every crossroads, the protagonist, either by choice or necessity, always follows the deviant path even when they ought to know better. This usually starts out small, some minor infraction, some petty deviation from the norm. But with each crossroad, the deviations escalate. Actions become more and more extreme, more and more socially unacceptable. But do we as viewers shake our heads and tisk tisk this misbehavior? No, we take pleasure in it. Movies give us a vicarious experience through a surrogate protagonist. And by way of this surrogate, movies allow us to play hooky from our everyday world with all of its rules and expectations, to allow us to indulge in mental misbehavior. And the more the protagonist deviates from normal rules and expectations, the more pleasure we receive. Now by deviant, I don't explicitly mean behaviors that are overtly immoral, criminal, or rebellious, even though these are certainly included. This label may apply to an infinite variety of behaviors. I mean, is this considered normal behavior? What about this? Or this? Or how about this? Yes! 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 Oh! 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 Really, deviant just means any action that a conservative-minded social authority would advise the character not to do. For example, in Lord of the Rings, Frodo Baggins is a hobbit and he's been told his entire life that hobbits do not go on adventures. So, every time Frodo chooses to continue his adventure rather than go home, he is further violating his cultural norms. 
Likewise, Luke Skywalker has been told to not ask questions about his father, to ignore the rebellion, and stay home on the farm. Because of this, simply showing an interest in Leia's message or speaking to Obi-Wan constitute deviant actions, as does every subsequent step that takes Luke further and further from his former destiny on the farm. In fact, any hero who seeks their own path rather than accept the one defined for them by others is a form of deviant rebel. Thus, whether we're talking about the risk-taking adventurer, the rom-com protagonist who takes outrageous action in the name of love, the obnoxious comedy hero who cares not who their behavior offends, or the action hero unafraid to use violence, movie heroes follow normally forbidden paths. And through our vicarious viewing experience, we are free to take pleasure in these behaviors without shame or worry, because there is no personal consequence to ourselves. Of course, types of deviancy differ from genre to genre and your personal preference in genres is a result of whatever appeals most to your personal fantasies. Psychoanalytically speaking, Altman's theory suggests that genre movies are pleasurable because they allow us to regress to an infantile world of fantasy, to a world where mommy and daddy are no longer there to control us. Because according to Sigmund Freud, following the rules all the time is psychically exhausting, and the id's bottled up impulses need some sort of healthy outlet. Movies give us an outlet through a consequence-free fantasy world where all of society's parental shackles have been removed. In this sense, the best example is 1990's Home Alone. I saw Home Alone when I was nine years old, and it was the shit! Kevin McAllister's parents went away, and he got to go nuts! He had ice cream for dinner, he got to wreck the house, he played pranks on adults. It was the ultimate child fantasy. And when we grow up and we meet a character like Goodfellas as Henry Hill, we meet what is essentially an adult Kevin McAllister. Henry Hill also does whatever he wants, because he too lives in a world where mommy and daddy don't exist. In fact, the entire opening sequence of Goodfellas is a series of crossroads where we see young Henry rejecting his parents' world to enter a world of pure ego-driven pleasure. But characters like Henry Hill and Kevin McAllister are hardly role models. And if we left the theory here at the pure pleasure stage, we'd only be giving fodder to those who accuse Hollywood of rampant immorality. But as we advance into the later stages of the generic crossroads, we encounter a boomerang effect that turns everything back around. See, ironically, Hollywood movies use fantasies of deviancy to ultimately reinforce social norms. Because the actions of such fantasy characters are actually not without consequences. It's just that the consequences have been delayed. And these consequences always show up once the character has gotten in too deep. Up until now, the character has given the audience pleasure by always choosing the deviant path, but this has an alienating effect on the character. As their path separates from the familiar community, the character essentially becomes an outlaw or a fugitive from society's systems of support. Eventually, their boat drifts so far out to sea that they can no longer see the shoreline. And that's when the chickens come home to roost. And when this real trouble begins, the pleasure turns into anxiety excitement into dread. The fantasy transmutes into a nightmare. Initially, the protagonist responds by escalating further, taking bigger and even more extreme actions down the deviant path. These too bring pleasure to the viewer, but the mix of anxiety starts to increase more and more until a point where the viewer realizes that things have gone too far. Actions have gotten too extreme, too unacceptable, or too dangerous. This ship is now too far out to sea, and all the viewer wants is to turn it around and head back to the safety of home. And at this point, the story takes a sharp inside turn. If the hero is to find a happy end, if they're to avoid getting stranded in this wasteland, they must return to society's rules and norms. Like the prodigal son, they must rejoin the world of proper attitudes and responsibilities, back to normalcy, order, and stability. And for the viewer, this return is just as pleasurable as all the deviant actions that led up to it. Like Kevin McAllister, we run back to the comfort of mommy's arms. We've had our fun, but we've learned our lesson, and we pledge to be good little children from now on. Oh, Annie M, there's no place like home. For a more grown-up analogy, on this channel I've presented a lot of ideas from folklorist Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung. And in the video linked above, you'll find a brief lecture that gives some insight into the generic crossroads through a remarkably similar metaphor. As Campbell tells us, Jung asserted that each individual has a choice between two paths in life, the right-hand path and the left-hand path. Those who take the right-hand path follow the plan society has laid out for them. They get the good steady job, they get married, they buy the house, and have the 2.3 kids. And if you find joy in that path, good on you, you'll do fine. But some of us find no satisfaction in this route. To them, the right-hand path is a prison, so they break away, taking the left-hand path. 
choosing, as Joseph Campbell says, to follow the way of your own bliss. By blazing their own trail, these individuals enter a realm where there are no rules, but no assistance either. And thus, as Joseph Campbell says, here you will live a life of danger, of creativity, perhaps not a respected life, but certainly an interesting one. The power of the generic crossroads lies in his ability to allow viewers to follow both paths at once. They can play and experiment with the left-hand side, see both its upsides and downs, its dangers and pleasures, without ever leaving the comfort and security of the right-hand side. They can journey away, but always return home once again. To sum it up, Lollipop, Rick Altman's generic crossroads with his escape from and boomerang back to social norms provides us with a story model to explain how Hollywood movies give us the pleasure of a safe, healthy outlet for all the infantile impulses of our id, only to rope us back into the superego with a lesson that encourages us to be functional, socially responsible adults once more. Let me know what you think in the comments and make sure to like and subscribe because I have a whole bag full of stuff like this to share. Next week I plan on doing something a little different, but it's just as a preview, it's going to involve space vikings. Until then, I'm the Squirt Monk. I'll see you at the crossroads. I'm going to miss everybody. I'm going to miss everybody. I miss my Uncle Charles, y'all. By the way, this isn't an issue of Cosmo. It's a 2008 issue of Script, so. <laughs> Semi-pro.